council who own the mill opened it to the public as a fascinating industrial site museum which is attracting thousands of visitors. Thomas Devey, like his father before him, has been a miller for much of his working life. He has retained his interest in his trade since his retirement and occasionally demonstrates the craft of millstone dressing at Woosborough. Millstone dressing is the work of cutting then maintaining the pattern of furrows and flat lands between them which is on the grinding faces of the upper and lower millstones. The quality and fineness of the flour produced from a stone mill depends very largely on the skill and care of the stone dresser. Mr. Devey first dressed the same stones he is working on here at Woosborough in 1925, more than 50 years ago. The first process in stone dressing is facing or levelling the grinding surface of the stone. A hardwood batten called a staff is used and it must be frequently proved on a special metal surface plate which ensures that the staff is true. It is coated with a coloured pigment on its flat face and then rubbed over the stone. Mr. Devey is using laundry blue mixed with a little oil to prevent over rapid drying. Traditionally, a paste of red oxide and water known as raddle was used. The pigment on the wooden stuff rubs off onto the highest parts of the stone, clearly indicating the areas which must be chipped down to make the face level. The cutting of the stone is done with mill bills, lozenge-shaped metal chisels weighing about one and a half kilograms when new and held in a wooden handle called a thrift. The bill which Mr. Devey is using has a tungsten carbide tip which stands up to work on a very hard stone much better than the earlier high carbon steel bills he remembers. They lost their edge after only 10 or 15 minutes work and needed constant resharpening. The stone dresser sits on the stone he is dressing, taking much of his weight on a bist or sack stuffed with chaff or bran, and skillfully regulates the force of his blows with the bill to accurately cut away the areas of the stone which have been marked by the blue pigment from the staff. Having faced the stone, the swallow is marked out, using a nail centred in a scrap of wood wedged across the centre hole or eye of the stone, a length of string and a sharpened sliver of wood dipped in blue pigment. The swallow occupies at least a third of the area of the stone and is a slight hollow or saucer shape in the centre of each stone which allows an easy passage between the two stones for the corn delivered through the eye. The swallow is critical to successful milling. Too deep a hollow and the stones may choke with too much grain. Too shallow and insufficient grain will reach the grinding areas at the outer edges of the stones. The depth of the swallow is judged entirely by eye and checked only with the staff, which, when laid across the faced stone, should show a gap of a little over one millimetre if the swallow is correctly chipped out. The furrows are the next part of the job. To mark out a new stone is a very lengthy task. Here Mr. Devey has only to recut the existing pattern, but even so the depth and width of each furrow and its intervening land must be checked and the line of the furrow marked in blue against a furrow stick or wooden straight edge. 
The sharpened sliver of wood again serves for marking, though Mr. Devey prefers the more traditional feather. Goose for the best results, he recalls. The pattern of the furrows is a traditional one, though not the only pattern used. The furrows have several purposes. They cut the grain as the rotating pattern of the upper stone crosses the stationary pattern of the lower stone with a scissors action. They ventilate the grinding area and they provide a passage out at the edge of the stones for the ground flour. Once marked, the work of reshaping the furrows and truing their edges proceeds methodically round the stone. Three furrows to a segment, or quarter as they're rather confusingly called in the trade, ten quarters on the stone. Altogether sixty furrows to cut on a pair of stones. The actual grinding of the grain is done on the flat lands between the furrows at the outer edge of the stones. On these lands the greatest skill of the dresser is exercised, for they need to be cracked by the cutting of tiny grooves parallel to the furrows. Mr. Devey is now only making about six cracks to the inch. In his working days he could do twelve or even sixteen perfectly parallel and cut by a line of single blows with the mill bill. The better the cracking, the finer the flour. continues round the stone, facing, marking out, furrowing, cracking. The change from one stage to the next as the dresser moves round the stone adds a measure of variety to a job which can take up to 80 hours for a pair of hard wheat flour stones such as these French burrs. These stones are made up of pieces of very hard quartzite, quarried not far from Paris cemented together and bound with iron hoops. They are highly prized for grinding bread flour. Millstones from Derbyshire and Yorkshire millstone grit, known as peak or grey stones in the milling trade, are slightly easier and quicker to dress than the French burrs. But they grind a coarser stock and are therefore better for making animal feed. Woodsboro Mill Museum, 
is open throughout the year from Wednesday to Sunday and on bank holidays when special events and exhibitions are arranged. Whenever possible, visitors see the mill machinery working, illustrating a milling process that was known in Roman times. Flour milling is an essential part of our social and cultural heritage, making as it does the raw materials for our daily bread, the staff of life. Woosborough offers a fascinating insight into agricultural and industrial history and craftsmanship. The noise of its machinery working awakens the echoes of 900 years of milling in the Dove Valley. <laughs>